When was the last time you saw someone using a Sony phone? It's interesting because if you look at these things on paper, they are just what many enthusiastic phone buyers are asking for. But here's why you're right not to buy one. For those of you who aren't fully aware of what the Sony Xperia 1 phones are, and I don't blame you, here's a quick rundown. They are flagship level phones with top of the line at Snapdragon chips, 12 to 16 gigabytes of memory, 256 gigabytes plus of storage, triple cameras with a motorized zoom mechanism capable of shooting Ultra HD 4K at 120 frames per second, and a 21 by 9 crazy high res OLED screen. Usually they cost upwards of sort of $900, so are competing with the flagship smartphones from a cost perspective. But not only do these devices have great specifications, they have meaningfully useful features that those competing phones don't have, such as 3.5mm headphone ports, amazing DACs to power them, and micro SD card slots for expanding the already pretty great storage. They even still have the notification LEDs and stereo front firing speakers, all whilst keeping the IP65 or IP68 rated system with the tallest SIM access as well. They have all the bells and whistles like wireless charging, 120 hertz refresh rate, and even come in cool colors as well. There are heaps of software tools for adjusting the display, the cameras, the sound output, all precisely to your liking too, which most phones don't bother with. But here's a graph of Sony's official sales figures over the past few years. The company is struggling to ship units, people are not interested in Xperia's, and if I'm honest, I think they're right not to buy them. See, these specs are all great to have and all that, but if you can't make a phone feel seamless, uh, smooth, modern, people aren't going to bother. Sony's software aesthetic for a good few years now has kind of lagged behind. It's very stock, nothing helps it stand out, especially compared to the unique software skins from the likes of Google, Samsung, and even Oppo at this point. Just look at the software update menu. It looks dated. I remember seeing this thing on phones generations before this one. And the camera apps are a really good example of this. They offer heaps of pro level features that we'll get to in a second, but segmenting your apps and not having a competitive all in one auto mode, like you'd find on a Pixel, Samsung or iPhone, is your first misstep. There is one there, but it's nowhere near as good as those other ones. People love shooting with smartphones because of one thing, convenience and this is something that the Sony experience sorry is clearly lacking. The reason people love shooting with iPhones despite the sheer lack of professional controls although they are becoming more so is because that they love the convenience of auto HDR, auto stabilization, auto focus. Most people don't want to fiddle around with those settings and you have all of that in something that fits inside your pocket seems like a no-brainer. Sony, on the other hand, has built its mobile camera system for camera enthusiasts, which is great. You get heaps of control, manually adjusting focus, shoot Ultra HD 4K at 120p for crisp, smooth, slow motion, and the ability to shoot log or with a look that aims to emulate that of the Sony Venice, a camera that costs tens of thousands of dollars. Something that camera nerds will absolutely love. Except that camera nerds have actual cameras, ones with bigger sensors, interchangeable lenses, and more granular controls. Heck, Zony even launched its ZV-E1, which gives most of the functionality of its FX6 cinema camera in something that, body only, will actually fit in your pocket. Hmm. So if your average consumer who wants a great auto mode and a great camera isn't buying Sony, and your professional photographer and videographer who wants control and quality isn't buying a phone for that task? Then who's this phone for? Is it audio enthusiasts? I mean, I know plenty of people who would spend big money to get a quality portable audio player and source, but as nice as the Sony DACs are and the Xperia ones do come with three months of Tidal for free, there's no balance connection, you know, either in the form of a two and a half or a 4.4 Pentacon which you can get both of in digital audio players for much less the cost of an Xperia 1. So again, who is the Xperia 1 for? Pun definitely intended, by the way. 
That's something that I don't think Sony really knows itself. In my opinion, the company is just throwing features together that other phones don't have in the hopes that that will drive sales figures alone. It's like the world is moving in one direction and Sony is going in the other, which is one big gamble to make and one that most don't seem to be following. Don't get me wrong, there is definitely a market for these phones. I'm a big fan of Sony phones. They took a lot of boxes for me personally, but I'm also not the average consumer. And the thing is, the nerds, the ones who would buy a phone for its specs and its features list, are usually the ones most concerned by software support. And Sony clearly isn't too worried about that because as you can look at this graph, the Xperia ones just aren't catered for long-term like the competition. And it actually doesn't make that many models to keep up with in the first place. Sure, Xperia's get some software updates, but with how aggressively Samsung and Google have been improving their future update commitments, Sony's lagging behind once again. And stuff like software support is actually important. You know, brands are coming on board with the fact that they should support their phones for a good few years post launch because people aren't upgrading every year. Just think about how Samsung's TouchWiz was a joke when it came to this kind of thing only a few years ago. And now Samsung's one of the ones leading the charge when it comes to software update commitments. As the cliche goes, it's so close yet so far for Sony Mobile when it comes to making a product and an experience that I can actually recommend to people. And it's a shame because Sony phones have serious promise. If the company could focus more on its UX and its post-launch experience, it could probably eat up another couple few percent of the smartphone market, at least here in the West where Xiaomi and Realme are further back. The Xperia 1 series has a lot going for it. As an audio guy, I love the inclusion of a 24-bit DAC and a microSD card slot. And I know people who are looking for a phone with the higher-end features and the higher-end specs, but with those features as well. Yet I can't recommend it because of the suboptimal user experience, which for most people is just not going to be worth the compromise. And for those wondering, here is my bite-sized 18 month review of the Sony Xperia 1 IV after using it for about a week. Look, it still looks great. It still feels great. I love the big, bright, responsive display, especially for watching films and HDR content. The front facing stereo speakers and haptics sound and feel world class, and the taller SIM card, come micro SD card slot, is a breeze. As an IEM hoarder, I loved having the DAC in this thing. It sounded fantastic. It gives you lots of options for controls and it was still handily able to drive my Sennheiser 58X headphones. The performance with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 and the 12 gigs of RAM in this model is great and works well for gaming if you're into it, although couldn't run Genshin at good settings. Though battery life isn't great for a couple of reasons. Mainly that 120 Hertz display doesn't adjust, it just locks itself at 120 hertz. Something that most phones tend to do, they're able to drop down the LTPO technology, lets them drop down to lower refresh rates to conserve battery. This thing doesn't do that. And the cameras, which I was excited to use actually, kind of fell flat. I mean, you can get some great images and video, but it takes far more effort than most people are going to be willing to give for a, a phone to get a good image. And the software, as I'm sure you were expecting at this point, is a pain point. Particularly if you're a few updates behind and you need to catch up, it's just taking forever to go back into the menu, restart, go back into the menu, download, restart. I, I can't, I was sat here for hours, it feels like, trying to update it. And the long-term support is just not acceptable for a phone that costs so much when it was new. If this was a $500 phone, I wouldn't be saying these things about it, but nearly $1,000. That said, I do love the physical fingerprint scanner and the notification LED, but I don't love those things enough to recommend you actually buy one of these. And that's where we're at with Sony Mobile, a company that piles in features that other phone brands have removed or won't include. A company that makes phones that most people won't buy. And you know what happened to the last company that made phones people wouldn't buy? I'll ask you this, how are LG and HTC looking in the smartphone space these days? 
Anyway, that's it from me, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. Let me know in the comments what you think of the Xperia phones. I'm personally a bit of a fan of them, but they logically don't make much sense. Let me know what you use yours for, or if you would ever buy a Sony Xperia again. Hit like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I've been Ryan Thomas with Android Police, and I'll catch you later. Cheers.